Can we put a mic on the speaker? Are the kids speakers? We learn that we are can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We are just uh, ironing out a few problems with the audio. Just give us a couple of minutes. I'm sorry for the delay. Oh, Shall we connect? To Can we just try it again, Dr. Pimo? Yeah, fantastic. You're online. Okay, we're okay? Yeah, we're okay. Um, Dr. 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 Puma, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, it's an honor for me. Um, um, you know, you've been my mentor and teacher, and it's a great pleasure to uh, have you lecturing on this topic to us. So please go ahead and start, Dr. Puma. Well, it's a great pleasure for me as well, uh, Jacob. Uh, I am very pleased to be able to communicate with your group and maintain our wonderful relationship that we established over the years. Uh, I congratulate you on your wonderful conference. It sounds like it's a very, very successful. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, next March and then uh, uh, at the ISMR in uh, September. So, uh, so I shall begin. It sounds like you, you're making great progress in maxillary facial prosthetics. And of course, I think uh, the center of the universe in our field is shifting to Asia, primarily to India. It's, that seems to be where all the energy and activity is. And of course, you have uh, most of the patients as well. You have a, quite a large patient population. So there's a great incentive to master these technologies and care for these patients. So I will begin. Uh, today I will just be speaking about acquired surgical defects secondary to oncologic resections. Uh, I will confine my remarks to tongue mandible defects, maxillary defects, soft palate defects, and facial defects. And the major theme of the talk today is that 
we have uh, mastered many of the technologies and methods that are required to rehabilitate these patients. Our biggest challenge now is to develop the kinds of interdisciplinary relationships that will make all these happen and make this a reality. So let me begin. Of course, I started seeing these patients back in the uh, late 60s. I graduated from dental school in 1967 and started a fellowship uh, with two gentlemen by the name of uh, Tom Curtis and Saul Silverman, and they ran a cancer rehabilitation program, and that's how I started. And so I saw many patients during that period, particularly uh, during my training period, and uh, there was an old saying in those days that uh, during this period that it was often said that the cure for head and neck cancer was worse than the disease itself. And that was certainly true in those days for many patients, particularly those that had had resections of their tongue and resections of the mandible. These were the kinds of patients that we used to see. Uh, the mandible was generally not reconstructed. The techniques for reconstructing the mandible really didn't develop until the late 80s, early 90s. So, gee, for the first 20 years I was seeing these patients, very seldom was the mandible reconstructed successfully. But more importantly, I think, in terms of the morbidities associated with the resection, was the loss of soft tissue, particularly the top soft tissues of the tongue. And uh, that's where most of the oral disabilities lie, it's in the resection of the tongue, and if our surgeons are able to reconstruct the tongue to restore its bulk and maintain its mobility, uh, we can do some very eff effective things for our patients. We can essentially return them to near normal. Now, when I first started, these are the kinds of defects we saw. Uh, because of the uh, problems associated with the tongue, uh, patient's speech articulation was dramatically affected. Uh, the patient did not have good co control of their tongue, and the mobility of the tongue was dramatically impaired by the means of surgical closure that was used in those days. And of course, without a mobile tongue and a tongue that you could control, you could not control your saliva. And so the patients were uh, unable to keep the saliva inside their mouths. Uh, because of the resection of the marginal mandibular nerve during many of these resections, the patients could not achieve a lip seal. And so they constantly drooled out the corner of their mouth. Uh, they did not have a normal vestibular uh, uh, configuration, and so the saliva very quickly got to the corner of the mouth and went out through the corner of the mouth. And of course, there were all these motor and sensory defects associated with the resection. And just, uh, just as important as the motor defect was the fact that the sensation on the resected side was pretty much eliminated. And of course, without a mobile, effective tongue, you could not manipulate the food bolus, and you therefore had difficulty mastication. Actually, the tongue is much more important in terms of mastication than the teeth are. And one of the themes throughout this talk is that if we had to choose between reconstructing the mandible and giving the patient, patient a bunch of teeth um, and, and reconstruction of the tongue, we would always choose the tongue. The tongue is the key to just about all oral functions, including mastication. And so our number one priority when we're communicating with our surgical colleagues is for them to reconstruct the tongue. Then, of course, with, that, with poor tongue function, you can't masticate effectively. You can't manipulate the bolus, get it between your teeth. Uh, of course, you had all these sensory de de deficits that contributed to that. And the deviation of the mandible, secondary to not being able to reconstruct the mandible, uh, made it difficult for you to get your teeth together, so you could not occlude your teeth in position. Now, with maxillary defects, it was quite different in those days, but only if the patient had a dentition uh, to retain their obturator prosthesis. And those patients actually did quite well. When we uh, convinced our surgeons to do skin grafts associated with the defect, as you can see here, 
We can suspend the actuator into the undercut associated with the skin graft. The skin graft being keratinized uh, would allow the patient to tolerate the appliance very effectively. And then just with a couple of teeth, it didn't take very many, just a couple of teeth to hold the appliance up on the unresected side, the patient was able to uh, function very effectively. They could chew, uh, of course their speech was restored to normal. Uh, they did very, very well. The biggest challenge in, uh, in those days was the restoration of patients with large maxillary defects that were edentulous. And it was very difficult with some of the defects that we were confronted with to provide the kind of retention and stability that you need in order to use the appliance to chew. The appliance itself could obturate the defect effectively so the patients could speak and swallow effectively, but because of the poor quality of the retention and stability of the appliance, they were not able to chew effectively. Uh, now we had some of the same problems with facial defects in the early days. Our surgeons did not realize that the defect or the nature of the defect was important to the quality of the facial prosthesis that we were going to make. So you can see these couple of patients on screen left uh, where attempts were made to reconstruct the nose and portions of the cheek and so on. And these were miserable failures in those days. We finally convinced our surgeons that this was a, a fool's errand and they started to leave the defects open. But these other two nasal defects that you see were also very poorly prepared to receive a prosthesis. And you really can't make a normal looking nasal prosthesis on these kinds of defects. The patient in the center, uh, the wound was closed primarily and the cheeks were um, brought in medially in order to close the wound and that distorted the middle portion of the face and the posture of the lip. And so it was very difficult to make a nasal prosthesis look normal. The same thing here on the patient on the right, if I can put the arrow over there, the nasal bones have been retained. And whenever the patient has a total resection of the nose, we want the nasal bones removed. Because if they're not removed, uh, the size and shape in, uh, of the nasal prosthesis is distorted dramatically. So at any rate, it took several years actually to convince our surgeons that they were just as important to the rehabilitation of the patient as we were. And if they gave us favorable defects, we were able to do some pretty spectacular things. If they gave us poor quality defects, if they did not spin line their defects, if they uh, uh, resected a facial part and distorted the adjacent facial structures, there was very little we could do to make the patient normal. Today, that's all changed. We have the technologies, and at UCLA, as you, as you all know, we have a terrific relationship with our oncologic surgeons. So today, almost all our patients can be restored to near normal form and function. And as a result, the, latter, the last 30 years of my practice have been exceedingly uh, satisfying. So what are the factors and the innovations which have contributed to this, this outcome? Well, there's two things that have happened in the last 30 years that are very important. One is free vascularized flaps, and I know you're all familiar with those. And the other is the introduction of osteointegrated implants. Uh, the flaps enabled the surgeon to reconstruct the soft tissue de defect, which was really not possible before vascularized flaps. And of course, the implants allow us to fabricate appliances which have retention and stability, which is uh, one of the uh, trinities of removable prosthodontics. So now we have these technologies. What's the challenge now? It's to encourage a multidisciplinary approach on the part of our surgical colleagues. Because far too many of them are, are, are not trained with prosthodontic input. And as a result, they are really quite uh, unknowledgeable of what it takes to restore a patient to normal form and function. And so one of your greatest challenges, your discipline in, in India, is to train your surgical colleagues so that they understand how to prepare their surgical defects or a prosthesis. So let's take a look at the impact of implants. Uh, these are all patients with large defects. Uh, some of them are edentulous, most of them are edentulous, and I'm showing you here. 
Um, but with the, the placement of implants on the unresected side and extending the appliance to engage the defect in a proper manner, just as when they had dentition present, you can restore just about all their oral functions to near normal. Uh, they're not going to chew or masticate on the defect side, but with a well-retained and stabilized prosthesis, they, they're able to masticate on the normal side, on the unresected side. So implants have made an enormous uh, difference for our edentulous maxillary resection patients. But if you look this, at this data, this is from Neil Garrett, and some of you know, um, this is the result of chewing efficiency tests of patients who have had, uh, who are edentulous and have been fitted with obturators. And before they're fitted with an obturator, their chewing function performance is almost zero. It's you know, six, eight, ten percent of what is normal. Other percent being what a normal dentate patient could could uh, masticate at. Uh, you take an edentulous patient with a big defect. They're almost down to zero. The appliance basically serves to uh, obturate the defect and allow them to speak and swallow, but they can't masticate. You add implants, just one implant on on the edentulous side, and immediately their mastication performance goes up to where it was when they had a set of conventional dentures. So it's a big difference. Now I want to speak a little bit about surgical reconstruction of maxillary defects. It's certainly possible now, uh, given all the innovations in the vascular flaps, to reconstruct the mandible with three flaps. But most of the time it's a bad idea. Uh, this is a very successful outcome done by a colleague of mine in Switzerland. And you can see it's a beautiful prosthesis for the fixed appliance. Um, gives the patient really a, an outstanding result. But most of the patients are not good candidates for this kind of reconstruction. Uh, really, the only justification for trying to reconstruct a maxillary defect with a vascularized flap is to provide bones so you can eventually make a prosthesis that has implant anchorage. And all too often, the flaps that we are given are soft tissue flaps. And a soft tissue flap that obturates the defect, as you can see here, uh, distorts the palatal contours, uh, makes it difficult if you're edentulous to uh, wear a conventional appliance. Uh, the only way this patient could ever wear an appliance was to stick implants into the residual uh, edentulous maxilla. And of course, the flap covers up the area, and it's difficult to monitor the area for recurrence. And so our surgeons at UCLA and most surgeons on the West Coast do not use vascularized flaps to reconstruct these large maxillary defects, particularly in, in patients who are uh, treated for malignant tumors. If the patient has a benign tumor and they're free of disease for several years, and there's a, a good likelihood that they are free of disease, and the patient's a young patient and under, uh, undergo the kind of surgery that is necessary, then it's certainly something to consider. But most of our elderly patients uh, that have malignant disease are not good candidates for this type of reconstruction. Another problem that we have encountered with some of these is the accumulation of mucus in the sinus. When you do a resection and then re reconstruct uh, the defect with a, uh, a vascularized flap, of course, the sinus mucosa is not normal. It's skin or it's uh, uh, squamous epithelium. It certainly isn't ciliated pseudocolumnar epithelium. So the, the, the lining walls of the reconstructed sinus lack cilia, and as a result, the, the uh, mucus accumulates in the, in the sinus, gets infected, it becomes odorous, and uh, it has to be irrigated on a regular basis. So it's another problem that people don't recognize unless they've treated a bunch of these patients. Let's talk about tongue mandible defects here. These are all examples of patients who really cannot function effectively. They have intact mandibles. The mandibles have been reconstructed, some with three flaps, some with three grafts, but because of the fact that their tongues were left unattended and not reconstructed, their oral function is really not improved very much by the restoration of mandibular continuity. 
all of these patients really have the same kinds of problems they had prior to their surgical reconstruction of the mandible. And the reason they have these difficulties is because the tongue was not reconstructed. So as I said before in my presentation, from my, pri from my perspective, the most important uh, single thing you need to communicate with the surgeons is the importance of the tongue and the reconstruction of the tongue whenever you have a, a resection involving the tongue. So the key to restoration of oral function is to restore the tongue bulk while retaining its mobility. Now here's uh, several patients, three patients, who have had their tongues uh, reconstructed with free vascularized flaps. The nice thing about free flaps is that the flap retains its flexibility, and if it's, if it's uh, tailored or shaped in the right way, the residual musculature of the tongue on the opposite side can move the flap and shape the flap, and the patient can, can relearn the means of articulating speech sounds. And they can also control the bolus. And the, now they won't be able to control the bolus on the side of the flap because the, the flap is really non-sensate. does not have the kind of sensory apparatus that the normal tongue mucosa has. And so the patient will have to confine the bolus on the unresected side, but the, these patients can masticate pretty effectively when they have their tongues reconstructed with free flaps. And I'd like to bring your attention to the lower two slides. This was the lady who had, oh, probably three quarters of the anterior tongue removed. She has a little bit of the tongue anterior to the circumvallate papilla. And I'm taking a picture there showing how her tongue moves around. This lady was a second grade school teacher before she had her resection. And she was able to go back and teach in the second grade because of the fact that she was able to relearn the means of articulating speech sounds sufficiently well so that she could teach second grade kids. So the key to everything is the tongue. <laughs> uh, I think, Jacob, you remember when... Uh, you were in our seminars together, and I would ask the residents all the time, what's the key to oral function? And uh, the first answer was the tongue, and the second answer was the tongue, and the third answer was the tongue, and the fourth answer was the tongue, and then I finally got the mandibular continuity being restored. Yeah. So it's the tongue. Here's a good example. This patient uh, had uh, a heavy glossectomy, and you can see that the uh, right-hand side of the tongue has been reconstructed with a vascularized flap. And it's been very nicely done and nicely shaped. And uh, so and this patient also had, uh, uh, oh, I think about 5,500 centigrade of radiation to the site postoperatively, but that's not so high, so high that they could not receive osteointegrated implants. So the, the big challenge in these patients before was to make an answer that was retentive enough and stable enough for them to masticate. And of course, with implants, we can do that. And so uh, we have this implant retained over denture, which provides retention and stability for the denture. Also, you'll notice that we've made a, uh, an imprint of the patient's tongue uh, elevation into the maxillary denture, which helps the patient's re reconstructed tongue interact with the palate. Uh, the normal tongue is used to a concave palate with uh, a concavity, uh, a fairly smooth and regular and symmetrical concavity, but a reconstructed tongue like this uh, does not elevate in exactly the same way as a normal tongue, and so you need to reconfigure the contours of the palate so that the tongue can effectively interact with it. So that's another thing, and here you can see the outcome. And this patient was able to chew, their speech was good, uh, essentially go on and, and uh, regain their normal lifestyles. And of course, implants uh, are, are, can be uh, done favorably in free flaps, but I want to bring your attention to the fact that not all patients who've had their uh, mandibles reconstructed with free flaps should have implants. Uh, and I bring your attention to the tongue that's reconstructed in the upper left part of the screen, that patient had, oh, 
more than half is done removed, and you can see how nicely the surgeon has reshaped the flap to make it look like a tongue. And the question is, should we put implants into that patient? The answer is no. We've got plenty of dentition to restore the dentition on that side with a removable partial denture. Uh, if we put implants over there, the patient's not going to be able to chew on that side. Why? Because they have no sensory input on that side. They will not be able to detect or manipulate the bolus on that side. The patient will only be able to chew on the left-hand side. Now, if this patient was edentulous, certainly you would consider implants. But since they have dentition, you're thinking about making appliances that restore lip contour and aesthetics rather than uh, mastication function. So when we do implants on uh, patients who have had free flap reconstructions, it's patients who have not had major re uh, resections of the tongue. It's patients who have had resections which have basically been confined to the mandible. And the rest of these patients that you see here have had resections of the mandible uh, and the tongue, and its sensory innervation has remained intact. So in these cases, it makes sense to restore or to replace the teeth with the help of osteointegrated implants. And you can see from this data that you basically bring the patient's mastication efficiency back almost to where it was before they started. Now, another topic that uh, I'd like to discuss is soft palate resections. And most of our surgical colleagues do not really understand the nature of velopharyngeal function. And you almost have to train them because they think plugging up a hole in the soft, in the soft palate defect will somehow restore speech. And that's just not the case. The key to... Uh, Velopharyngeal function is a muscle called the levator veli palatini. And you can see from this uh, diagrammatic sketch here the way the levator pulls the soft palate posteriorly and superiorly to engage, to allow the soft palate to engage the, the posterior pharyngeal wall. That's how we all speak, that's how we all swallow. And uh, the control over that muscle. And this is adjacent musculature is very, very uh, elegant. Um, that soft palate is, uh, uh, or at least my soft palate, as I'm speaking to you today, is uh, working very hard. It's running a mile a minute because it's constantly elevating, uh, depending upon the nature of the speech sound that I'm producing. When I produce a plosive sound like a B or a P, that soft palate is elevated and uh, uh, very intimately closes the oral cavity from the nasal pad cavity. Whereas when I'm making, say, an M sound, the soft palate is more in a down position and a lot of the ear stream and the sound goes through my nasal passages. And of course, there are many sounds that are, are in between. And so when you're uh, communicating with your surgical colleagues, you have to make them understand that it's the levator muscle and its remnants that are the key to restoration of speech and swallowing and velopharyngeal function. Now here you see a patient that has lost their entire soft palate. And you might say, well, it's going to be impossible to restore this patient's speech to normal. And the answer to that is, no, it isn't. It's very easy. In fact, this is one of the easiest soft palate operators you would ever make. And let me tell you why. Um, soft palate has been removed, but if we go back, you can see that the uh, levator inserts into a cartilaginous tube in the posterior lateral portion of the pharyngeal wall. It's called the tu uh, torus tibaris. And the the muscle comes down the posterior pharyngeal wall from the torus for about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, and then it finally goes across the midline and joins with the opposite side to serve as this sling which elevates the soft palate during species swallowing. Now in a resection such as this, there are remnants of the levator muscle in the posterior lateral pharyngeal walls. And so if you can engage those remnants in a precise way with your speech bulb, as you can see in the lower right-hand side of the screen, you will 
restore the patient's ability to control in a very precise manner the distribution of sound and airflow between the oral cavity and the nasal passage. The key here is access to the residual elements of the levator muscle. If you have access and if you can keep the appliance retained in position in a precise manner, you can restore speech to normal on every single patient. Now, our surgical colleagues don't quite understand that, and sometimes they try to reconstruct this area, and usually they do more harm than good, and I'll show you that in a minute, the results of that. But anyway, here's a, here's a patient who lost, or a couple of patients actually, who have lost, oh, almost half the soft palate. Uh, they had tonsillar neoplasms as well. The neoplasm extended from the tonsil into the soft palate, and then the usual customary resection. And you see flaps have been used to restore the lateral pharyngeal wall. Important to note here, the flap has not been tied to the soft palate. It's been left open and free. And so that's exactly what we want because we have access to the levator on the opposite side of the defect. Uh, if you look at the, this patient on the right here, where you see my arrow, the obturator actually extends behind the soft palate and extends towards the left pharyngeal wall and engages the remnant of the left levator. And so if you have access and if you have a means of retention, and here we have a couple of canines that are being used to retain the obturator, the patient will have perfect speech. The big problem in these dentalist patients is retention. And before implants, it was difficult to retain some of the appliances that we made uh, because of many, many reasons. Uh, most of the time, it was the posterior palatal ciliary was uh, distorted to the point where we couldn't get good seal for our maxillary denture. But today, we can place implants into the premaxillary segment, and with uh, the retention and stability gained from the implants, again, we can precisely uh, contour and engage the residual levator musculature that's left and give the patient a perfect speech result. This is what we would rather not happen. It, uh, if you see, if you look at the patient on the right, the flap has been tied to the soft palate. And what that does is eliminate access to the residual later, levator muscle, musculature in the left side of the pharyngeal wall. If you look at the patient on the left hand screen, that's a successful reconstruction with a flap. Uh, the only re successful reconstructions I've ever seen with the soft palate defects is when less than half of the soft palate was resected. And uh, this was done by one of our surgeons at UCLA, and it was a, it was a successful outcome. Uh, it was interesting to note that the same surgeon did the closure on the one on the right, and that was very unsuccessful. So there is a you have to explain to the surgeon what it takes to restore velopharyngeal function. And it's an active levator musculature on the unresected side. Now, this is an interesting patient. This is a patient who had a tonsil, soft palate, uh, carcinoma, and it extended down into the base of the tongue. And you can see that a good portion of the uh, soft palate was removed, as well as a good portion of the tongue. And this is a beautiful surgical reconstruction. It's actually, actually perfect. It's exactly what we wanted. The tongue is reconstructed with a flap. And the lateral wall of the pharynx is surfaced with the flap. Soft palate is not tied down in any way. There's access to the residual levator musculature on the left pharyngeal wall. So we make a partial denture, make our speech obturator uh, prosthesis, extend it up and behind the soft palate to engage the residual levator musculature on the left pharyngeal wall. And bingo, the patient has almost perfect speech. This is a perfect outcome. This is exactly the kind of interaction that we want to see. And these are the outcomes that we expect. Now, let's go on and talk a little bit about uh, facial defects. Um, if we get, uh, we'll start talking about nasal defects first. Uh, there are some basic principles that we've all developed during the years. And if those principles are abided by, by the surgeons during their resections, we can give patients almost perfect nasal prostheses today. What are those basic principles? Well, we want the nasal bones resected. 
uh, if the nasal bones are retained, they will distort the residual nasal prosthesis, make it too large, make it difficult to blend it into adjacent facial structures. At all costs, secondly, we want the surgeon to avoid distortion of the lip, cheek, and nasolabial fold areas. They can do this by, by lining the raw tissue surfaces with skin. If they try to close the skin margin up against the mucosa margin, they will pull the cheeks medially and create a middle face contour that's quite concave. And the place of a nasal prosthesis on that type of, of uh, facial defect is it's not difficult, but it's difficult to make it look like it really belongs on the patient. We also want to avoid distorting the position of the upper lip. If you tie the upper lip margin to the mucosa margin on the floor of the nose, you'll pull the upper lip up and distort the position and contour of the upper lip. And it will make it very difficult to make a nasal prosthesis that interfaces properly with the upper lip. And of course, we want to consider osseointegrated implants as well because they improve the retention of the appliance. With ear defects, we'd rather have total auriculectomy defects. We want the surgeon to retain the tragus because it hides the anterior margin. Uh, if we have a defect, we want it lined with a split thickness skin graft. We don't want any rotational flaps brought in because they have hair follicles in them. So we don't like those kind of flaps. And we'd like to have implants placed. With regard to orbits, we'd rather have the, the uh, orbit lined with skin we do not want to see distortions of the eyebrow. In this case, the eyebrow area was irradiated. That's why there's not much of an eyebrow left. <laughs> we certainly don't want to have the defect closed with a flap. If you want to have a prosthesis, if you want to make a prosthesis for the patient, if you put a flap in there, you can't make a prosthesis. Because we don't want their eyelids retained there either. So if we... If we do things properly, uh, we have, if, we, if we have proper defects, and you can see these are good, both good defects, the, the floor of the nose has been lined with skin, uh, the lateral defects have been lined with skin, you can make a nose look like a nose and it interfaces with the lip in a proper manner. In auricular defects, the same way, you say, save the trachis, line the uh, wound with a split thickness skin graft, and you end up with really nice outcomes. The same thing with orbit. If you have room to place your <clears throat> ocular prosthesis and to develop proper lid contours, you can make a perfect overall prosthesis. And all of us in prosthodontics have these abilities. And of course with large defects, now with implants in particular, we can give these patients quite a nice looking appliance that allows them to uh, re-engage in their social lives. The key factor during resection and closure is that the surgeon should attempt to leave adjacent contours, tissue contours, undisturbed. Now, sometimes it's useful to line raw tissues with skin. We always want to see that because it gives us a bearing surfaces for our prosthesis. But we don't like to see tissues distorted because of the need for closure. So here we have all these, you can see these large mid-facial defects. And the outcomes can be really quite impressive when you have implants and you prepare the defects properly. And of course, when you look at the utilization rate of facial restorations that are retained with skin adhesives and you compare them with implant retained facials, it's a big difference. The patient's favor, as you can see from these yellow columns, the uh, the implant retained appliances, and they tend to use their appliances effectively. Now, last, I'd like to talk a little bit about the CAD CAM revolution in maxillofacial prosthetics, if I may. This is an area of particular interest of Dr. Jai Giannetti, as you know. Um, it's gotten to the point now where Dr. Giannetti is involved in just about every mandibular resection that's going to be reconstructed with a fibula flap and, and the patient is destined to receive implants. As he actually now is, is, is dictating the terms of the resection. He plans the resection from the perspective of 
the prosthetic rehabilitation and tailors the, the fibula in such a way that implants can be placed in proper position and the patient can be rehabilitated. And of course, that's the opposite of what it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the, uh, we used to make these very crude stents and the uh, surgeon would attempt to use it to at least get the fibula in a reasonable position. Now it's possible to control all these things with great precision because of the CAD CAM technologies and some of the software uh, treatment planning uh, programs. And so here's a patient that's destined for almost a total resection of the entire body and synthesis of the mammal. This was an ameloblastoma. And as a young man, he's only 19, 20 years old, and so you want to restore his ability to function as well as his cosmetic appearance. And so this appliance that you can see is actually planned and developed prior to surgery based on his uh, opposing dentition and uh, contours of the maxilla. And so here you can see the way the appliance is dictating the contours and positions of the osteotomies of the fibula and the way it's located in position. And so this is a much more precise means of tailoring the fibula and placing implants. Uh, before we used to just eyeball everything. Now with the ad, with the uh, advent of these treatment planning uh, programs and CAD CAM and, and such, we can do a much much better job. And so in the future, you as prosthodontists are going to be more involved in planning these resections, particularly when you're considering placement of implants. And here's another case. Uh, it's a unilateral mandibular resection case. And here again, the fibula is based on the pre-surgical plan. The, all the osteotomies are perfectly planned. The angles of those osteotomies are going to be perfect now. And uh, uh, the success rates and the outcomes are just going to be dramatically improved. Also, of course, implants now are playing a, a bigger role in these large maxillary resection defects. Um, we used to make prostheses for people with very large defects, but they had to hold them in position with their tongues. And of course, in, in patients with large resections, there are few, if any, implant sites remaining in the palate. And so the zygomatic implant has become a real asset in our practice in restoring patients with large defects. And it used to be that zygomatic implants were relatively difficult to place, but now with these new treatment planning tools and with the use of either fully guided surgery or navigation surgery, it's much easier for our surgeons to get them in the right place and with good anchorage. And so this is one of Dr. Giannini's patients that he has recently restored who had a total palatectomy defect. So, uh, I, to sum up, let's, talk, let's try to sum, sum, summarize all the things I've said uh, in the past. Frequently, patients would be referred to us after the research, surgical resection, and this is always a disaster. Very, uh, it's infrequent that we can really restore the patient to the level that we would like when this happens. Uh, very often, there's little. There was in the old days, there was little or no input, input from our specialty, and this resulted in defects that were just not restorable in many cases. But now, for instance, in the maxilla, we know that if uh, we interact with the surgeons and they line this defect with skin, they save the pre maxillary segment, they place implants, and patients are going to be edentulous. They maintain access to the defects. So we can make prosthesis. They put in osteointegrated implants. We can restore these patients to almost near normal form and function. And if the patient uh, comes in with a tongue cancer or a tonsil cancer, um, and the surgeon plans to restore the bulk and uh, re maintain the mobility of the tongue, we have a chance of restoring these patients to near, near normal function. And so now, um, the surgical re re reconstruction of the oral defect is being driven by the needs of prosthodontics. And uh, of course, we, we've had that philosophy here for UCLA for many, many years. And 
one of our prime objectives here at UCLA is to try to spread this mentality across the world. And that's why we've done these outreach programs in, in India and in the, in the Middle East and Europe and so on. We're trying to really not so much spread the technologies, but to spread the culture so that people will interact. So our people in prosthodontics will interact with our colleagues in surgery and radiation oncology. Because we have all the tools now to bring these patients back to their normal form and function and allow them to re-enter their former positions in society. But we need to, to uh, create an interdisciplinary environment in order to make this happen. So what are the factors and innovations which have contributed to this outcome? Well, as I said before, free vascularized flaps, osteointegrated implants, but the real challenge now is to create this multidisciplinary approach. And if we do that, uh, we're going to do some very nice things for our patients in the future. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. <laughs> and uh, if you have any questions, okay. I'm happy to entertain any questions that we can get them through um, the computer. As, as usual, Dr. Buma, that was an amazing lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I think we can show the hall. We have a, almost a full house here. Uh, we'd like to, I, I'd like to ask you two questions. Um, the first is, uh, you know, uh, the flat cam um, uh, processes uh, that you showed um, for the mandibular reconstruction with the free flap. So you do an immediate implant placement and immediate loading of the processes. Is that right? Uh, we're not doing immediate loading. We're doing immediate implant placement. Okay. And the implants are covered. And then the appliance that you saw is delivered uh, well, several months later when the osteotomy sites have healed. And the implants have also integrated. You wouldn't recommend so, uh, uh, immediate loading. No, we're not immediately loading those. No, that's a good question. And the second question I have is, uh, you know, for orbits, you were saying that uh, you know the eyelids need to be removed and they need to be skin lined. You know, Correct. I've spoken to so many of ophthalmologists. But they like to, uh, you know, if we tell them to line, they will take the eyelids and line the defect with that. And then when the patient blinks, uh, the whole area moves. Yeah, well, we don't like that, do we? <laughs> See, our appliances are static. They're not built to move. The only kind of appliance that moves is the ocular when the ocular muscles are still attached to some kind of an implant. Uh, so... They just don't understand the nature of a normal prosthesis. And the way to, 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 to explain it to them is just to start showing them some pictures and explain why. Okay. But uh, they, they need to keep the, the defect open. Right. Just get a few questions in, Dr. Buell. OK. I like doing it this way. I can stay in my house and and uh, communicate with you guys all the way across the world. It's, it's a wonderful technology. Um, Dr. Pimalaro, what is the presentation? Um, I wanted to know what do you do when you have a, a, a large maxillectomy defect going all the way to the orbit? What is your uh, treatment plan for patients like that? Do you uh, put enough flap for part of it? Do you debulk it later on, then place implants? Or what, what is your sequence of treatment? I don't think he's able to hear. I think no, I'm trying to hear the question, so you'll have to repeat it. Anybody else have questions? Uh, Dr. Buma, I just wanted to ask you, uh, uh, this is, uh, I'm Dr. Rajiv Chah, maxillofacial surgeon. Uh, we had shown a defect yesterday of a patient where we had to uh, do a maxillectomy going all the way up to the orbital floor, or including removing the orbit, and extending partly onto the soft palate. What do you do with defects like that? 
uh, how do you decide how much do you reconstruct and how much do you obturate or you know rehabilitate with the prosthesis? So, so was this an maxillectomy uh, and an orbital exoneration? Was the orbit exonerated? No, the orbit was intact. It was only up to so the orbit. reconstructed the floor of the orbit? Yes, with some mesh. And then, so what we did was okay. put in some mesh and we put in a rectus muscle. But as you discussed, the flap becomes very bulky. And that sometimes is a problem with, you know, giving a prosthesis. So, and this patient doesn't have enough bone for a zygoma implant. Um, is he edentulous or does he have teeth? Uh, he has teeth on the other side, so we have teeth for retaining a prosthesis. Well, we have dentition, uh, and uh, of course, uh, was this a uh, maxillectomy and all that done with a Weber Ferguson? Uh, yes. Okay, well then, uh, with the skin line lateral well and some access to the lateral well of the defect with a well-designed obturator and, and teeth for retention, I would just make a maxillary obturator prosthesis with a removable partial denture framework and retain it in that way and restore the palatal contours for that. And how high would you extend the obturator into the defect? I would extend it as high as I possibly could. The higher you extend it, um, just because of the mechanics of, of the way it's designed, the better retention you're going to get. And plus the fact that uh, you might be able to support the mid-face a little bit more effectively with the obturator extension, you can push out the, the, the deep bit, uh, depending upon the nature of scarring in that area. Okay. Uh, the other thing is in terms of, terms of maintenance, what do you do with your max, you know, obturator patients? Um, do you have any specific regime? Do they come back ever so often? Do you see any problems with, you know, uh, uh, in the long term with maintenance? <laughs> Well, maintenance is a challenge for any, for all dental patients. The biggest problem in maintenance is taking care of their teeth. In terms of the defect, it's, it, all they really need to do is to swab the area with two by two gauzes every time they brush their teeth so that the mucus accumulations don't dry out and accumulate in the defect. That's the biggest challenge. And uh, what I generally do is give them a, uh, a uh, hemostat. Or I, I don't give them a hemostat. We, you can buy a hemostat fairly cheaply in the United States, you just take a two by two, moisten it, and they swab the, uh, the skin lined area, the defect, and try to detach whatever uh, uh, dried mucus areas there are. Because that's the biggest problem, is keeping the defect clean and free of, uh, of these dried mucus areas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Good evening to you, Dr. Bjorn. This is Srini here. Uh, I have a question. Um, we often see patients uh, uh, of uh, heavy mandibulectomy where even the condyle has been resected. And such patients, when they come for a secondary reconstruction, desiring both uh, treatment uh, and, and replacement of the dentition, uh, we are not very sure how predictable the outcomes can be. So, but do you suggest uh, taking you know, the fibula right? Uh, through and through, right up to the, the fossa, or to use a condylar prosthesis, or how should we be counseling such patients for uh, with regarding to expectations from our with outcomes? It depends on uh, what else is resected besides the mandible. Um, you know, it'd be unusual for the condyles to be resected. That's something that's not done very often in the United States. Uh, why would the condyles be resected? No, a lot. It's just a practice uh, sometimes uh, just go ahead and do a heavy mandibulectomy. Not everyone ends up retaining the condyles, although we do try to uh, uh, inform them about the importance of the same in, in, in bit of application in the future. So, well, um, you can function, you can certainly masticate and function effectively with a mandible that's connected only to one condyle. Uh, you know, the, the range of motion is a little different, and the uh, envelope of motion is different, but you can function quite effectively uh, with without a second condyle. I don't think I would try to reconstruct the condyle. I would just try to re restore the contours uh, of the mandible on that side, and uh, whatever prosthesis you would make would be uh, primarily cosmetic, because the patient would only really be able to generate force on the unresected side because of the loss of the condyle. And um, if, you, if you try to reconstruct the condyle and restore the 
and, and connect the masseter muscle to some of these uh, reconstructed mandibles, they end up getting a lot of trismus, and it's very difficult to, to you get inside the oral cavity and so on. Uh, years ago, before we, could, we were reconstructing the mandibles, we could re we could restore function to patients who had any mandibulectomies very effectively if they had good tongue function. Because we would just uh, make these uh, physical therapy appliances to train their their mandibles so they could get their teeth back into occlusion and they would just function on, on the on the uh, unresected side very, very effectively. So restoring the dentition on the resected side in those patients is really a fool's errand because it, the patients that end up not using anyone. So TV that's mainly an aesthetic cosmetic uh, reconstruction uh, issue. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, sir. Uh, Good morning. And Dr. Nandar Bazaar. Uh, sir, I want to uh, thank you, honorable uh, viewers. Uh, we are very lucky to get one of the pioneers of maxillofacial orthodontics. So my question is, uh, what is the future trend for maxillofacial orthodontics? What are the role of stem cell? What are the roles of new technologies uh, in the field of maxillofacial orthodontics? So can you please enlighten us? Uh, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> That's quite a question. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the Weintraub Center, but the Weintraub Center is a tissue engineering research lab that we established in our department about 20 years ago. And of course, uh, the goal of the Weintraub Center is to replace our acrylic resin with uh, tissue, viable tissue. So the future, to me, is to try to reconstruct some of these uh, defects uh, with tissue, and particularly with, res with respect to the tongue and and soft tissues, it's pretty easy now to reconstruct the mandible with these free vascularized flaps. I, you know, that's, well, that has been a spectacular advancement. Uh, so I'd say uh, tissue engineering would be one thing that we would, uh, I would look for. And of course, CAD CAM is going to have an enormous impact on, on your profession because you, as the experts in oral function and oral contours, and the way the mandible works and the ways the soft palate works will be asked more and more to become engaged in the re in the planning of these resections from the perspective of putting the patient back together so that they can be functional. So I'd say the two things would be uh, the digital technologies that are involved that are evolving now and tissue engineering. Those would be the two fields that uh, I would anticipate would be pretty active in the next 20 years. Uh. Dr. Bhuma, thank you again uh, so much for being with us and uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, Kochi in March. Okay, I, I look forward to seeing you too. Okay. You take care. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.